Hey, I'm Ben Barton. I'm a professor here at the UT College of Law, and I'm here to explain how we got there. And in particular, I'm going to explain overcriminalization and having too many people in jail. And the question I'm here to answer is, if every poor defendant in the United States is appointed a lawyer, how is it possible that in this country we have people pleading guilty to crimes they didn't commit? How is it possible we have innocent people on death row, proven innocent by DNA evidence? What's gone wrong here? I'm going to explain it. So the, and I'm going to explain it actually by calling out two very, very, very famous Supreme Court cases and explain why despite having their hearts in the right place and writing beautifully, the Supreme Court headed down the road that led us here. So let's start with Powell versus Alabama. So this is the Scottsboro Boys case. It's a super famous case. There's nine African-American teenagers on a train. They get pulled off the train in Alabama by the sheriff. And along with them on the train, there's two white girls, two white teenagers. Now, when they're first pulled off the train, the girls don't say much. Uh, they seem fine. 20 minutes later, they claim they've been gang raped. It's a super scary situation almost a lynching right there. They take the nine boys to jail and hold them. There's almost a lynching that night at the jail. And then they have to bring out the National Guard to have the trial. Now, one reason why tempers were still running high at the time of the trial is the trial is 12 days after the event. They had the full criminal trial. Uh, the Scottsboro boys, uh, friends of theirs, send a lawyer down from Tennessee but he's a real estate lawyer with a drinking problem. The court assigns a local lawyer, but he's a seven-year-old Alabaman who knows almost nothing about criminal law. The trial is a sham. They don't get a chance to meet with their clients. They don't get a chance to cross-examine the witnesses. The prosecution puts on almost no evidence. There's no medical evidence to support it. One of the girls can't even say who raped them, can't identify any of them. One of the girls later uh, changes her story. It's a mess. Oh, and of course, there's an all-white jury. It's Alabama in 19, 1930s. Um, Alabama Supreme Court hears that on appeal. Looks good. Eight of the nine defendants get the death penalty, and the ninth one, who's under 18, gets life in jail. It comes up to the U.S. Supreme Court. So. This is the, one of the first cases where the U.S. Supreme Court overturns a state court conviction, so it's sort of famous for that. But it's also famous because the Supreme Court focuses in on the lawyering, says that the boys did not have effective lawyers, and you need effective lawyers. They can't have this kind of trial without a lawyer. Now, there's something interesting about this. This was a case where there was no shortage of reasons to overturn it. Uh, it was a disaster from start to finish. It was 12 days, 12 days after the incident, no cross-examination, not the right kinds of lawyers. Uh, the jury was all white. They could have chosen any of these, but the court chose to focus on the lawyers. And you'll see in a second that that's a theme for them. So from Powell, you get a right to a lawyer then in federal trials, and you get a right to a lawyer in a death penalty trials, but there's no broad right to a lawyer in state court uh, criminal prosecutions, and of course, the great majority of criminal prosecutions happen in state court. So that brings us to Gideon versus Wainwright. So this is another one of the Supreme Court's most famous opinions. It's a beautifully written opinion, and their hearts are in the right place. This is the case that assigns a lawyer. You get a free lawyer if you can't afford one, and you're uh, accused of a felony. And this is a felony in state court, or and we already had it in federal court. So after Gideon, they keep extending this right. They extend it in Argusinger. They extend it out to misdemeanors generally. And then Alabama versus Shelton. If you're going to spend even a day in jail of punishment, you get a free lawyer assigned to you. And again, the argument of the court is these are serious consequences. If you're going to face criminal penalties, you need to have a lawyer before you face criminal penalties. And that all sounds great. And believe me, if what you got was a super hardworking lawyer who was effective and had five, 10 cases a year, that would be awesome. And that would call, be called being rich. But if you're poor, that's not how it works out. So all of these cases, Argusinger Shelton, are in the 60s and the 70s, um, and the, where the Supreme Court is still expanding criminal rights. You'll note, I didn't say anything about whether you get an effective lawyer. 
And we don't find out about that until the 80s when the Supreme Court is a much less giving mood. So in Strickland versus Washington, the Supreme Court describes how you can prove that your lawyer has been ineffective. First note, Powell's in the 30s, and the first time we get an actual test for ineffective lawyering on the federal level, it's in the 80s, okay? So they took their time. They wanted to make sure everybody had a lawyer, but whether that lawyer was good or not was a different issue for them. Uh, in Strickland, they announced a two-part test for ineffective lawyering. And both parts of it are really, really, really hard to prove. And reviewing courts can choose whichever prong they want to do first. So the first prong is deficient performance. And note, deficient performance is not we just look at it overall and ask, did you get what you paid for? Are you happy with your lawyering? It has to be really, really, really deficient. Um, but even more worrisomely, you have to prove prejudice. So basically, you have to prove that you would have won at trial except for the lawyer. So what do these uh, appeals look like? Well, you won't be surprised at all. The courts start with prejudice, and they just list all the evidence that you were guilty. And then when they get to the end of it, they're like, no prejudice here. Uh, but the crazy thing is, of course, there's a bunch of evidence you're guilty. He barely had a lawyer. Listen to this. In state courts, drunk lawyers have been held effective. Sleeping lawyers have been held effective. Lawyers who use horrible racial epithets, and I'm not going to repeat them, about their own clients have been held effective. Lawyers who are disbarred show up and do the trial anyways, effective. Lawyers on amphetamines or cocaine at the time of trial all found effective. And again, it's because of the prejudice prong along with the effectiveness prong. The second thing to note about this is that the Supreme Court guaranteed a lawyer but didn't guarantee any particular funding for lawyers. And you won't be surprised to find out at all, politically, it has not been super popular to fund public defender's offices. And so all over the country, you have public defenders who carry these huge caseloads, 100 felonies a year, hundreds of misdemeanors a year. There's no chance that they can try these cases. There's no chance that they can even investigate these cases. If you're wondering why it's a quick, meet them and plead them system, it's not the fault of these lawyers. Believe me, they are doing God's work. It's the fault of the funding, and it's the fault of Strickland, and it's the fact that the Supreme Court guaranteed a lawyer, but not any particular type of lawyer. And that's how we got here.